Welcome to this week's edition of Coach Prep. Coach Don and I are here in the Cherokee Batting Range Podcast Studio getting ready to record episode number 206. We're going to continue our discussion as we work our way around the infield. We're going to talk about first base and how to coach it better and make sure that we're getting the most out of the kids that are playing that position. Before we get into that, though, let's talk about our sponsor, the Anderson Bat Company. Everything Fast Pitch is very proud to have Anderson Bat Company as our presenting sponsor. Anderson Bat Company is using the latest and greatest bat technology to corner the market in the fast pitch world. They have the minus 9 rocket tech, the minus 10 carbon, and the minus 11 carbon light. Anderson Bat Company is using this technology to put a high-performing bat in the hands of hitters that really know the difference between a good bat and a great bat. We're also working with Anderson to provide a discount for all of our listeners. Go to the Anderson Bat Company website and order your bats. Use the EFP20 discount, which is for everything fast pitch, and you'll get a 20% discount. And again, take advantage of that EFP20 discount. It's a great way for you to save that additional 20% and help support the podcast at the same time. Speaking of supporting the podcast, if you're in a position where you can, if you see value in what we're doing, we would love for you to become a patron. Go to patreon.com slash everything fast pitch. We're talking about $5, 10 or $20 a month. Coach Don and I have Love doing the podcast. We really enjoy getting together every week to talk about it. We are so close to breaking even if we can get three or four more people to come on board, assuming we don't lose any of our current patrons. And want to make sure that we're always thanking the patrons that have been with us from the beginning. Uh, we have some people that have been supporting us now for a couple, two or three years. And obviously, we really do appreciate their support. But we would love to add a few more people to the list if we can. So go to patreon.com slash everything fast pitch. So Don, first base. So first base is one of those positions, and as we work our way around the infield, has some very specific challenges and needs. One of the things that I think happens uh, quite often is it's one of those positions that physical stature and the size of the player sometimes influences who dictates. we think should or dictates yeah. who should be playing that position. But I will say this, the best first baseman I ever coached was five foot three. Pretty cool. So, so maybe, it's done not, a good job. Yeah, yeah. maybe it's not always just about how tall you are, so let's get into it. How, how do we make sure that our players at first base, the kids that are playing first base, are going to be prepared on game day? I was going to say on that note, Tori, if everybody makes good throws, it doesn't matter how tall you are there, right? Right. That's well, she was pretty good at stretching and digging and, and, and picking and all that kind of stuff, too. So first base is one of those positions that we think, well, you know, they just throw you the ball. No, I know. First base is kind of one of those, almost like a little bit of a, an infield leader right. of, of sorts. And uh, again, to be able to do all those things is uh, something that needs practice. Right. And if we're structuring our practice to take care of the needs of the first base person, I think that that's really important. Some some things I think that get neglected are uh, footwork needed when they're making a stretch and then throwing to another base. Right. You know, if we've got a runner on second base and a ground ball hit to the left side and the throw over to first base and we make the out there, but having to get the runner that takes off from second, right. doing things like that, having good quick footwork is something that may or may not happen if you never practice it. But if you do practice it, they're going to be a lot more prepared to, you know, be that split second quicker, right? Um, drop third strike, things like inside a, the bag, outside the bag, inside the bag, outside yeah. the bag. And for them to uh, be able to stretch with the opposite foot and we're a left-handed first baseman might be important for us to uh, to practice over right. there, and often we do have them. Things like pop-up communication with the catcher. It's a lot easier for a ball off the bat to be caught by first base, but we don't need to be colliding with the catcher that's you know, trying to do all they can to get to everything that they're able to get to. Fence work. Yep. If we've got a pop fly over there on the fence, do we do that at practice? Those are a lot of the little details. Obviously, they got to field ground balls. They've got to be able to throw to turn double plays. You know, they need to be able to field bunts and do all those right. things. But there's a lot of little side pieces that I think that would enhance their uh, overall gameplay if they're able to identify some of those pieces at practice to cover just for a few minutes. Right. I think that'd be helpful. Well, I think uh, one of the things that you touch on, Don, that n number one to me is depending upon your coaching philosophy, exactly how much you're having your first baseman do. First base is one of those positions where... I've seen some teams, basically, the first baseman's only job is to stand around first base and, and catch, catch the throws. Ball. Yeah. And there's others where they're fielding bunts, where they're cutoff person, where they have you know backup responsibilities, where they have all kinds of different things that they're required to do. And so I think the first thing for our coaches is to make sure that we're clearly identifying what we expect from that position. And then once we 
have designed our team philosophy. So for me, the first baseman was always aggressively charging bunts because at the higher levels, you know, kids can bunt the ball where they want to. We always had more confidence in our corner infielders fielding bunts than we did in our pitchers fielding bunts. They would be really active on that. We always used our first baseman for the cutoff person for throws to home plate from the outfield. So we would, you know, work on that stuff all the time. We would spend a, quite a bit of time working on, you know, the throw in the dirt, digging the ball Scoop. out. You know, we even had the good fortune because we were playing at a pretty high level of working on when the shortstop would be deep in the hole that they would be throwing the on purpose long hop throw across the infield to make sure that the throw stayed down. And so working on all those different pieces, but I think it starts off with us creating a pretty clear philosophy about what we think the first baseman's jobs are, and then doing a really good job of practicing and drilling and working on all those different pieces to make sure that they're totally confident in their ability to do it. And again, here's the trap that we're going to talk about at probably every position on the field. Do we need eight other kids standing around while we watch the first baseman work on digging throws? Do we want to make our shortstop throw the ball in the dirt on purpose so that the first baseman can dig the ball out of the dirt? Or are those the kinds of things that we should have an assistant coach or somebody else doing on the side as a separate drill, as a separate station, so that we kind of get the nuts and bolts work done before we're trying to do it all with the whole team? I'm personally one of those. I never wanted to ever, 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 ever ask anybody to practice doing something badly. So I never had my shortstop purposely throwing the ball in the dirt because I couldn't see any benefit for her in practicing something that we hoped she would never do. Now we knew she would do it. We could pitch her throwing the ball down the middle. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like making your pitcher throw batting practice so she can get used to throwing fat pitches down the middle just never <laughs> made sense to me. Well, the shortstop practicing throwing the ball like a crazy person, I don't want to plant the seed that throwing the ball like a crazy person is a good idea. How we break it out, how we do it in groups, those kinds of different things, you know, I think is all something that coaches have to really be thinking about. And unfortunately, the trap that a lot of us fall into is we get it in our minds to work on one thing, one specific skill, one specific position, and we haven't thought it through well enough. So we really do have the first baseman working really hard while a whole bunch of kids watch her. And we need to make sure that we're keeping all the kids working really hard while the first baseman's working on her first base specific stuff. No, I think that's exciting, Tori. And again, strategizing a practice, I think, can be challenging. Right. You got to get creative. You got to walk through it and figure out how we can maximize our time. Because when we talk on the podcast about all of these things that we can do, I can remember having practice every day to do all this stuff, right? right. But now when we've got these mega practices on the weekend and we can't get together because of the weather for two weeks. And there's a lot to try and cover when we get together and right. and to not wear them too thin when we do get together. But to create a list and have good strategized practices, I think, is optimal. And the point that you're making, if you're only going to have a few practices, you dang better squeeze everything you can in that needs to get squeezed in. I think, unfortunately, what ends up happening is we fall into the trap of thinking that if we just hit a few more ground balls, that's going to solve all our problems. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with repetition. There's nothing wrong with getting reps in, you know, and honestly, there's nothing wrong with watching a team go through their infield and it looks really good. And it's kind of fun to watch them because they're pretty good at it, but we're not winning or losing games because of our players being able to do all the routine stuff really well all the time. We've got to be able to do some other stuff too. And it's that balancing act between can my shortstop pick up a ground ball that's right at her and throw it to first base or Can my first baseman dig out that bad throw because the shortstop had to go deep in the hole and make an off-balance throw, and it's going to be a bang-bang play at first base? Well, in those situations, if that first baseman's maybe hoping she might kind of might catch it, right? or she's worked on digging the ball out of the dirt and having good footwork and stretching for the ball and all that stuff a bunch of times, I know which one I'm much more in favor of. So the moral to the story that we're going to probably keep coming back to is I think good practices always have position-specific time built into them, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, where your first base players are spending all their time working on first base stuff. Your catchers are spending time working on catching stuff. Your pitchers are working on pitching stuff so that they've got plenty of repetition and plenty of opportunities to work on it. And then you can do the fun stuff like the first baseman reaching into the dugout and robbing the pop-up. Right. Or 
making the uh, over-the-shoulder basket catch in foul territory because she's the only one that can get there. Or digging that ball out of the dirt because the shortstop is trying to make the ESPN top 10 play of the century, but the first baseman's got to seal the deal and make the catch at first to make it happen. I got one pet peeve on, on first base stuff stretching too early just in the direction like if a shortstop's throwing to a first baseman that we stretch straight to him and then the throw's off and we're leaning falling over to the side or something like that not waiting to see where the ball's going to go before we stretch to the ball rather than to the player but yeah that comes back to our our premise that if we're working on it enough then we can explain to the first baseman and work with her enough on we'll see where it's going and then stretch to it we're stretching to the ball not to the right and those kinds of things and so thrower yeah the Biggest thing is be really clear cut what you expect your players to do. And for all the teams that have the first baseman basically just stand at first base and catch throws, I think you're missing out on a lot of opportunities. And and especially for that player's development, um, I would much rather see them involved in a lot more stuff. And Tori, I like what you're saying, though, about describing what their responsibilities are. So yeah. they get to look at it and they go, oh, these are the things I need to be mentally prepared to right. do. And then physically work on them, and now I'm game ready. Right, and because the other thing that some of what we're asking the first baseman to practice is not fun stuff. If they go home and you know, mom or dad say, okay, let, you know, we, we can work on something today if you want to, or, or do, what do you want to work on? How many first base players are going to be like, hey, can you throw a bunch of crappy throws in the short, dirt so I can get hops, short yeah. hopped and, and hit in the shins and hit in the forehead and, and jam my fingers and all this stuff trying to stop them? I mean, that's not going to happen. So we have to continually reinforce why that's so important. From a coach's perspective, we've got really drive the point home. We always talk about, you know, giving the add a baby to the player that deserves it. Well, if the shortstop makes a diving stop and makes an amazing play and throws the ball across the infield and the first baseman stretches and makes an amazing dig to get the ball out just in the nick of time to get the out. Twice as awesome. It's Twice as awesome, but 99% of the accolades get showered on the shortstop, and maybe one or two people go like, hey, yeah, nice job. Expected at first. So yeah. it should be an equally emphatic jumping up and down celebration. One, because my shortstop just did something that's amazing, but two, because my first baseman did something equally amazing for her position to make that amazing thing To finish the happen. deal. Don't get me wrong, coaches. I know for some of you, the first baseman just catching the ball is going to be amazing to start with. You know, expected. If, yeah. And actually getting a ground ball out in the infield is going to be something that's you know worthy of celebrating. But we have to start off with making sure that we're spending time helping these players be ready to play that position. And if we think it's, you know, just put your foot on the bag and catch the ball, mm-hmm. we're going to be disappointed before before we're going to be able to remember it. What a beautiful thing when everybody's doing all these little pieces right. Hey? Yeah. And that's hopefully what we're accomplishing with this series. So next week, we're going to talk about second base. Awesome. All right, so that's going to wrap up number 206. Please make sure you support Anderson Bad Company. Go to patreon.com slash everything fast pitch. Become a patron if you can. Go to the fastpitchprep.com website. Order your Square Cuts training discs. Also, we have the YouTube channel and the blog post. There's a lot, a lot of information there that you'll really be uh, excited to have access to. Make sure you reach out to us at everythingfastpitch at gmail.com or fastpitchprep at gmail.com. Questions, comments, ideas, suggestions, thoughts, anything you want us to talk about. Coach Don and I always love talking about topics that you're interested in. And make sure you order the Square Cuts training discs. They're forty nine ninety five a dozen, again, at the fastpitchprep.com website. So for Coach Don McKinley and our producer, Stan Lewis, this is Coach Tory saying thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again next week.